Um, just to tell you a little bit about Plus Plus, and I'm actually gonna stop the uh, music so you can actually hear me, is um, Plus Plus, we are a, are a knowledge sharing hub. Um, we have a number of um, modules as we call them from event management for workshops and live classes to uh, tracks uh, for modeling onboarding or blended learning to experts where we help uh, folks uh, model uh, mentorships and coaching between people within their organization. And so we like, you know, we're, we feel extremely privileged to work with such amazing companies like Shopify and then have the opportunity to invite them to events like this where they share about programs and things they were able to accomplish <clears throat> in this space. And so today, um, I'll be actually asking Peglas in a moment to introduce her, uh, herself. Um, today, we'll have Peglas from Shopify tell us a bit about how Shopify empowers globally distributed uh, employee communities to build, grow, and scale uh, through a remote technology. Now, Peglas is in, she's a facilitator, so she's in the space of learning and development. Um, but the community she'll talk about is one that's, that's more distributed than our space of L&D. Um, but it very much intersects with what we do and how we um, in, in L&D think about sort of not just educating people, but creating communities around the things that they are learning. So I feel that this is one of those talks that is, is broadens a little bit our, our horizons and, and broadens the kinds of conversations we normally have uh, here. So I'm really excited about that. So with that, I will stop sharing and I will invite Peglas uh, to introduce herself. And in doing so, um, just tell us a bit about Peglas, like, you know, what do you do at Shopify? Um, how long you've been on the team and, and in the space of learning and development and what excites you the most about your job? And let's start with that. Thank you so much for the intro, Sasha. Can everyone hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, give me a peace sign if you can see. My slides are right, asking peace signs, so we're good. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here to chat with you a little bit about our story today. Um, so I've been at Shopify for just about three years, two months, um, which we say Shopify years are like dog years, so seven years, <laughs> because you learn and do so much in just one year. Um, so it's been three years, but the actual amount of time I've been working as a facilitator in learning and development has been one year and a half. So here's a little bit about Shopify in case, um, I don't know how great our brand visibility is outside of Canada. So here's a scoop. You might have heard of us if you've shopped online or if you have any friends who are starting a business. We are pretty big, it's over 5,000 employees. And one big thing that happened this year is that we decided to go completely remote. So this is my team. This is a little anime rendition of us because obviously can't do a team photo this year with the pandemic and being globally distributed. And on the left is what a normal day looks like for me as a facilitator now. So lots of facilitating over Zoom or Google Hangouts or Meets and uh, connecting virtually with people. My main part of my role is to onboard new hires to Shopify. And in the past six months, we've onboarded over a thousand new employees around the world and truly around the world like not just around the US or Canada but we have people starting in APAC in um, Africa in Europe and it's been fantastic so outside of my role as a facilitator um, you know obviously learning and development is really important to me and what I do and I started to kind of transition those skills into helping out with my own community I am first generation Venezuelan I'm Latina and Canadian. So I wanted to work with this community that we have at Shopify because I realized there's actually a lot of us there. Um, so we have this employee resource group program um, that is created by employees for employees. And it's part of our diversity and belonging program across the company. And basically these are special interest groups uh, that get together to advocate for um, for their community to make sure that they feel included, valued, and heard across all levels of Shopify. Awesome, thank you so much, Peglas. So, and as, as, as you sort of uh, uh, teased it, like what we're gonna learn about is the story of how you took this community 
um, and amplified it with your colleagues uh, using your skills you know, as a facilitator, tools, and, and sort of company support structure to make it happen. But before we do that, can you tell us a bit about, like, can you paint a picture of the challenge that you saw uh, that you had to sort of solve for? What, what, what led, uh, what preceded this sort of scale that you were able to, to accomplish? Definitely. So last year, I even have some photos to show you. We had a really great Latinx History Month in 2019, like building up rooms, lines out the door, uh, really great activations with food and spaces, with people getting together. And we had this wonderful plan of how we were going to just replicate the exact same thing for 2020. Obviously, Circumstances change. So the day came in March where our office announced that not only were we closing for a week or two weeks or two months or a year, but we were going completely remote. So all of our plans, we literally had to just delete the document. We're like, okay, everything we've worked on, everything we were thinking of just out the window and we had to completely start fresh. So our challenge that was presented was how would we create an exciting, engaging, global, month-long community celebration remotely? And I will add to that that we had at this point maybe around uh, maybe around 200 people in our ERG, which to me seemed like really great number, lots of people, but I wouldn't say it was a very strong community either. I felt a lot like it was always me or my co-chair, Daisy, for the ERG, who are the ones starting the conversation, inviting people to things, but not necessarily that it was really like something that everyone was contributing and feeding into. So that piece of community within this challenge, I think was like the part that really stuck out the most to me is like, okay, this is what we really need to approach. Got it. So, 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 so essentially it wasn't just make this work like it did before, it was like make this work and make the community stronger, stronger as a, at the same time. So, what um, can you tell us a bit about how you explored how to move forward? Right, like here you are, your document, your entire, all your plans are out of the window. Uh, you have to uh, sort of go back to the to to the square one and figure out, you know, how to make this happen given these circumstances. I'm sure that there were a number of, you know, op options that you explored. And can you tell us a bit about the thought process that eventually led to what you ended up doing before you actually tell us what you did? And, <laughs> um, and who did you work with? Uh, who did you need to get buy-in from? What did that look like, right? Just, just that, that brainstorming and convergence, you know, to eventual solution. What did that feel for you and your team? That is such a great question, because when everything hit in March, I would say like the last thing we wanted to do was to think about Latinx History Month, you know, like everyone was worried about their families, their livelihoods, their communities, and we really had to take a step back and see like, where do we even look for inspiration to move forward? So the first thing that was happening for me that I started to really look and dig into was that my team, uh, the facilitation team had to completely redo our onboarding program because we had this beautiful three-day experience in person that we were running every single uh, every two weeks and we had to we didn't want to just bring that to like zoom because everyone knows that wouldn't translate super well so we had to think of how we were going to manage like asynchronous pieces and synchronous learning and how we were going to use different forms of media. And so all these things that we were experimenting and researching there, I was kind of like tucking this away, starting to think of how we could transfer that to the Latinx ERG. On my own time, started doing a ton of research and looking at all these different industries. I was looking at um, what was popular on like Instagram or TikTok, like what were people responding to? I saw, you know, every single celebrity in April, June was doing Instagram lives and I was like okay what do people actually want to tune into what are we giving our energy to and why so I was asking myself a lot of these questions and our team was continuously meeting up comparing research going through like 
white papers for experiential marketing, for other virtual events, looking at what was happening internally within our organization, but also what were other groups doing, uh, what big events were happening, what conferences had been taken online, and just gathering and gathering that all to try and figure out how we could put that all into an actual working strategy. At the same time, my team was also looking at how to build community remotely because this was a challenge and a fear for many of our new hires. So I was looking at, you know, what elements of like human psychology can we draw from around human connection, around community, and around ownership that, um, you know, that we're using for our onboarding program that I could translate to this community. Awesome. Um, and so what, um, did you have like a specific parameters you were optimizing for? Obviously there's, there's so many different things, uh, you can, you can try to, uh, you know, accomplish, but at the end of the day, there are trade-offs. So do you, you know, what were the things that you were, you know, what were your actual priorities and how did you eventually, you know, eliminate some of those options and then settle on the solution you went with? I think one of the trade-offs was knowing that, um, that work has to come first. So as much as we'd love everyone to like drop everything and attend every single one of our events and be super, super active in our Slack channel and everything, um, we knew that people have like their actual jobs to attend to. So really had to kind of balance that in how we were designing our programming, um, how often we were gonna have events and what our calendar looked like also thinking of the fact that we're globally distributed. So we have members of our ERG or people who'd want to attend our events who were based in Japan, who are based in Nigeria or New Zealand. And so when we were thinking of, you know, what time we want to host something, I was starting to realize like, it can't just be me staying up at 3 a.m. to host an event every single week. So we were starting to look at that. And um, so I'd say, yeah, like the, the timing, the types of events and really being conscious of being inclusive of that. So it's not just like, oh, anyone who doesn't live in this time zone has to watch it on demand or something, you know? Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like, like you, you kind of teased it a little bit. You talked about, you know, getting other people involved. And I know, you know, you as a facilitator, you're usually the one who runs the show, but here you are trying to essentially globally distribute it and get uh, get your colleagues to step up what did that look like what 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 you know can you tell us a bit about sort of that path and uh what what did you need to make that happen Ooh, such a great question it's funny looking back at it now because it feels so simple but at the time i would say the very first thing we did now switch slides here to our strategy um, was to experiment. So we realized we still had like three or four months until our event. So before we even open up the floor or anything, we just started trying a bunch of different stuff. We're like, have we ever posted a video of ourselves announcing an event before? Nope, let's do that now. <laughs> or um, different times to see like when was the most popular. And some of these experiments were great, but some of them were terrible. Like I remember I hosted this one, just like casual hang because people said that they were feeling lonely and that they wanted to connect. So I was like, okay, let's have a hangout. What time was good for people? Okay, after work. So 5 p.m. came, I waited on my computer for one hour and not a single person joined the meeting. <laughs> and uh, that was my moment when I was like, okay, maybe this is not the time for us to connect. Um, so we had a lot of failed experiments that we learned from, but we also had a lot of successful ones that started to help us realize, for example, that people wanted to be connecting in ways that didn't necessarily mean turning their video on or like active participation, or that we had sometimes more viewers after something happened than when it was live. So having things on demand maybe actually is important. So experimentation was like the very first thing that we're like, okay, you know what? What are really the consequences here? Maybe embarrassment, but I can live with that. So <laughs> um, just really putting ourselves out there and trying anything, whether it was just some like funny social media trend or hosting a hangout or trying a new game, just like putting everything on the table and giving it a go. Um, and then second, we decided that because of these constraints, because of these 
um, goals that we had to make sure that this was actually a global event, that it was inclusive, and also that we were showcasing different identities within the Latinx community. Like within the Latinx community, we have people who are Asian, who are Black, who are, um, you know, who have disabilities. We have like people of all kinds of different groups. And if it was just me and Daisy hosting, you know, you'd only get one side of the picture. So we decided to open it up to anyone from our ERG. Um, any idea that they had, we just put out a Google form and we're like, if you have an idea, respond to us within a week, tell us your idea and uh, we'll take a look and see if we can make it happen. And we had two goals here. So first of all, to be able to spread the load, to be able to host more things because one month is kind of a, a marathon. If it was just one person hosting, it would be pretty crazy. Uh, secondly, to build community because we were like, if it keeps being just me and Daisy just poking at it and hosting things, this doesn't give anyone else the opportunity to step in and to really build that community and contribute. Like maybe the reason no one is contributing is because we're not giving them the opportunity to. And then thirdly, we needed to build leadership capacity. We needed more people on our leadership team, two people for the entire world, not enough. So we were hoping that people could get this experience, start to understand uh, what it's like and hopefully get a taste of it and enjoy it. So it put me and Daisy in a position to be more coordinating, um, making sure, well, first of all, you know, we'd go through all of their event ideas and see if it's possible. How can we do it? Who do we need to partner them with? What resources do we need? Um, but really giving them the champion position. Like, you know, they're the ones who get to lead it. Their face is on the flyer. They're the ones who really get to uh, be the star of that day. And so that was really cool. And then lastly, sponsorships. So we partnered with internal groups and I'd say like kind of influencers within our organization, some who, you know, you'd traditionally expect to be like our chief financial officer is our executive sponsor. And so her support was huge for us, um, but also people who are just kind of like, I don't know, well known within their team or known to be like a have good taste <laughs> or whatever, just reaching out to them uh, and partnering with them to share what we're doing, share our message and uh, incentivize that participation. So, I mean, this is this is actually awesome. And I know you were, you're gonna share with us the results soon enough, but um, how, what do you think was the one thing or a few things that led to people engaging with this model? Like, you know, so many times, I'm sure this, this is true for me. I don't know how many people on the call would admit to it, but like, you know, we would, put out call for participation of this kind and you know crickets people wouldn't show up or they would show up in a sort of in a smaller capacity what was the thing that you feel made this happen and you know got people excited to actually you know show up and and really participate and, and take leadership wow that is such a good question <laughs> i have to think about that one for a second i think a lot of it has to do with just the world this year. Um, I, as I was watching the trends and starting to kind of get an idea of what the landscape was like as we were heading into Latinx Heritage Month, um, there were obviously a lot of racial tensions happening around the world, a lot of protests. Um, we were in an environment where people actually really wanted to be involved and really wanted to help these communities. So I was seeing that there was a lot of investment in our success because people wanted to see the employee resource groups and these communities um, succeeding and wanted to help. So we actually saw during that time of like the Black Lives Matters protests this summer, um, our ERG ended up growing by like hundreds of people. Um, we went from having 200 to maybe like 400 and then 600 people in our ERG. And I think a lot of it was because people started to be more aware of the issues that many communities are facing. Um, so I think part of it was timing because definitely, you know, people were feeling lonely. They wanted to be part of something. They want to belong and they wanted to make a difference. So I guess in many senses, we just kind of had the right opportunity at the right time. But we also did a lot of work in advance trying to make our environment very welcoming. So anytime people would put out an idea before, we'd always try and approach it with that kind of like yes and mentality, not just like, no, no, I'm in charge. 
I, I call the shots here, <laughs> but like, you know, this is a great idea. Maybe it's not possible exactly the way you suggested it, but let's see what we can do with it. And um, even just in our Slack practices, every time someone joins our ERG, we send a welcome message. We introduce them, where we ask them to introduce themselves. We always take so much care, like anytime someone posts, like to make sure to comment, emoji, engage with them. So people really feel that um, their voice matters and that they that they belong in the ERG. Because I think a lot of people, myself included, have a lot of um, feelings around whether we belong as Latinos or Latinas. And um, there can be so much gatekeeping within these communities. And so we really were trying to eliminate that. So I think seeing that 38 people came through and signed up and led activities for us was really kind of proof that our strategy was um, was paying off and that people were feeling welcome. That's awesome. Awesome. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see some of the, the you, you prepared a few slides that sort of showcase what this looked like. Do you mind taking us through, uh, through this experience so we can see if we can re, re imagine it uh, in our heads? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. This is like my my pride and joy. I am so excited with how things went this year. It still just blows my mind. So imagine one week before the event. So this is like early September. Uh, everyone at the organization received an email from our chief financial officer announcing Latinx History Month. This was literally unprecedented. Um, none of our executives had ever stepped up in that way. I think no one had ever asked them to. So we asked the CFO and she said, yes. And we're like, all right, let's do this. So she sent it out. Um, more experiments here. We decided to launch a newsletter. So we also sent that out to every member of our ERG. Uh, someone created a script for us that can pull emails for Slack members. So that was key. Uh, we had our welcome post going out. We did a video, Daisy and I, uh, a presidential address that was actually honestly terrible. But <laughs> it was kind of funny because it was so bad. So we put it out anyways. And uh, we had everything up in, uh, in sessions plus plus and we had it up in our internal wiki, uh, like a full calendar of everything people could expect. So we're coming at people from all angles, like Slack, email. Uh, if I had their, if I had their cell phone numbers, I would have texted them. Like anywhere we could reach them, we're letting people know what's going down. And just this week, we again grew our channel from over 200 more members. So that was pretty wild. We're like, okay, people are into it. This is happening. So thanks to our wonderful volunteers, because we literally could not have pulled this off without them, we ended up having a ton of activations. So I've put a list here. I have pictures to show you and everything, but just to keep it simple, we had a keynote speaker from Disney Pixar who came in. She was the cultural consultant for Disney's Coco, which is like my favorite movie, so super excited to have her. A musical performance from Lido Pimienta, who's a Latin Grammy and Grammy? normal Grammy nominee. Uh, we had a Latinx literature video put together by a volunteer, dance classes for samba, salsa, and bachata put together by employees. Um, another employee, the developer, put together a Shopify version of Loteria, which is like Mexican bingo, which we played live, um, cooking classes on demand, and tons of people that we had scheduled in a full content calendar of people sharing stories, photos, and video in Slack. So whether it be about their experience like moving to Canada or their first winter or uh, being an employee, like a Latinx employee in tech, all kinds of stuff. And one project that I thought was really cool was Indigenous facts were being shared to highlight that intersectionality between Latin American and Indigenous folks. Awesome. So the results are pretty wicked. We had five stars unanimous feedback on all of our events and session. We ended up with 1,257 registrants compared to 113 last year. And I thought last year was a huge success. That was in person. We had food for people and free drinks. And then this year, obviously no food or drinks. Still, <laughs> we had more people show up. So that was incredible. 
Um, our engagement in Slack, that's where all of this is pulled from during those 30 days, just was through the roof with um, 592 messages posted and only 35 of those were scheduled. Uh, sorry, 34 were scheduled, 150 views per post, 107 members posting, and 450-ish out of around 620 of our members actually looking at the channel. And if you use Slack and you know how many channels there are to look at and how many places there are to draw your attention, that's a pretty exciting metric. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, go on. I, I do have a question about those numbers, but please go on. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, like, you know, if you consider all of these, like, what is the what what is the one thing that sort of you're most proud of, uh, either as a number or as a, as a as a thing that happened as a result of all this effort? Oh, let me show you. I think it's slide this way. The feedback from our community straight up was the most important thing to me just to see how meaningful our events actually were for people and to see that all over like not just in our channel but i had keywords set up so i could see like if people were posting in other channels if people were posting in other places what people were saying and what they were thinking when i think of like this comment from Maida saying that the crg has made it possible for her to feel at home here at shopify um people talking about like their how this made them think of their families or their heritage or finally feel like welcome to be their authentic self at work. That to me was like the most powerful takeaway. That's awesome. Um, thank you, but I feel free to, I, I saw a couple other slides you <laughs> wanted to share with us. So please go back to it. Yeah, I'll show you just a little bit of how our events actually looked. So here on the top, we have a game of Loteria, which is like a Mexican Bingo, it's based a lot on like culture and heritage. Really fun, you should check it out. Uh, we had these hangouts on the bottom where we would um, meet up with groups from different ERGs and discuss kind of like tough topics together. It was really interesting. So for example, um, the role of the woman in the family in immigrant families, that was one of the chats that we had that someone had proposed and we're like, let's do it and had a really great conversation. Um, we had dance classes, someone taught us how to make arepas, Karen put together these super popular videos about Latinx literature, she should totally be a YouTube celebrity. Um, we had people sharing like recipes they were cooking with their parents, this real talk panel about uh, being part of the diaspora. And um, I started hosting a radio show. So <laughs> that was new to me, but has been a lot of fun. And that was a cool way for people to join and be part of something without having to actually like be on video. That is awesome. Um, and before I uh, ask uh, you a few more questions about the results in the future, I do want to invite the rest of the folks in the audience to, to start thinking about their questions. Uh, and uh, feel free to post them directly in the chat so that after we wrap up, we would uh, open it up to your Q&A. Um, so Peglas, um, you know, what do you, so you, you shared with us a bunch of these successes. Uh, what are your biggest takeaways, or your biggest lessons learned? Um, and if you were to do this again, and I hope you, will, you are, or your team will, what, is there anything you would do differently? So for takeaways, it was really hard to come up with just a few, but this is what I came up with for all of you. Um, I would say number one is to really allow yourself the freedom to experiment. I think of even last year, all the ways that I held myself back just before an idea even started to take flight of being like, oh, no one's gonna be interested in this, or what if it doesn't work? Or what if no one shows up? Now I've been there. I've been there when no one shows up. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> like, I just put on some music, I got through it, and I knew that was something to like learn from. So I would say really like allowing yourself that freedom to just give something a try. And when I say experiment, I don't mean even just with like types of events, but think of different types of media, techniques from different industries. Like so much of what we did that really kind of like kept the conversation going, we were pulling from like social media management books and stuff like areas that are not my area of learning expertise um but looking for all these different sources of inspiration um the second thing was that stepping back allows others to step forward and so i feel like i tried so hard 
over the last year to, I think, to kind of create the community, you know, I wanted to have the secret sauce, I wanted to set all these measures of control into place. So like, if we did x, y, and z, people were going to feel part of the community, and people were going to be part of the community. And realizing that actually, I had to step back and allow other people to take that ownership and really like, um, give them that space to step up. That was that was huge for me. So really kind of letting go. And finally, the community is group ownership. It doesn't work if it's just one person. And this actually kind of was like a weird sort of light bulb moment I had while teaching our onboarding, because one thing that we tell all of our new hires, and I hope I'm allowed to say this extremely, <laughs> is that everyone owns culture. And the idea is not that like our culture team is gonna make the culture perfect for everyone. Like, yes, they're here, they put together fun events, maybe send you a Christmas present, but that's not their job is for the day-to-day -day culture. Like you're the one who's in charge of making the culture that you wanna see. So when I started to think of like, yeah, like we all own this and that's the same for our community. That was really kind of like the light bulb moment for me. That is so awesome. And is there anything that you would do differently uh, next next year when uh, or or did you think other folks trying to emulate this, uh, whether they're on this call or other ERGs at Shopify that they're doing their own communities? Uh, is there any, any advice you would give them? One thing I would love to do is find more ways to engage people on the other side of the globe. We did have some volunteers sign up from New Zealand and from Australia, which was great, but it was just like two or three of them. And so I would have loved to be able to offer more experiences for people in that area that weren't just on demand. But I think like, I think there's so many more things I want to experiment with. Like when I look even just at like, I don't know, like the latest memes or trends, like, I don't know if anyone here follows Bad Bunny, but he put out this video and he did this funny dance that everyone's been doing. I'm like, what if we did that? Like, what if we just put that there? I feel like I'm so much more okay with like being silly and letting things fail now <laughs> that there's so much more that I want to try that I'm like, oh yeah, next year, I have so many ideas. So <laughs> I think I'll continue to see, like, you know, definitely continue to experiment, to look at the landscape. Things are changing so quickly right now. So it's hard to say exactly what that like next trend or next idea will be, but just continuing to really keep tabs on, um, on what people are doing and what what's working. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one interesting thing and that is that, um... Um, you know, this year, people specifically because of COVID and maybe, you know, what was going on, not maybe, but definitely because of also what was going on in the uh, in the Black Lives Matter uh, community, uh, felt the need to get connected, right? Um, do you think this is sustainable? Do you think that next year, when hopefully some of us are going back to, to work, um, do you think that the, this urge is still going to be there? And is there anything that you feel like, you, you, you know, you'd be able to, to to bring back into this program to continue the, to, to keep the high energy high and engagement high? That is, that's such a good question. I think that, you know, these issues are systemic and they will always be present. So um, for many of us, and I'd say particularly for our community, it's not even a choice of wanting to pay attention to it or not paying attention to it because you're living it every day. And so I would hope that, um, I would hope that people continue to be conscious and to want to engage with issues of social justice or um, make a difference in their communities. But I think overall, especially with globally distributed companies, the need to belong and be part of a community is always going to be there because you don't have that kind of built in for you um, just by like, seeing the same people in the physically every day or going to the same lunchroom like these groups are that experience for you now so I would say at least for our globally distributed completely remote forever team <laughs> this is definitely sustainable and what we've been seeing so far like I put out a survey to all of our volunteers and I was like would you be interested in continuing to volunteer with us 100% said yes so that was great wow. and as we just put out our leadership applications two weeks ago we had um, over 10 people ended up applying 
think so pretty great like way more than I expected and such a change from when we first started the ERG where we had maybe like 15 people total participating so I think it's been just great growth so far and so they are continue to I'd expect to continue to see that is awesome thank you and actually that's my last uh, sort of um set of questions I have for you is uh, that's the future, right? So there's two aspects to it. One is like, how do you see this shaping up in the future with this community and other communities? And you already touched on that a bit. And then the other aspect I'd love to hear from you is how do you see this translating over to your day job of facilitating onboarding or other, just, just the general space of L&D? What can we learn from this, even if we're not ourselves driving or you know participating on an ERG? So in terms of the future, I would see us like, my point is literally, I would love to do exactly the same thing next year in terms of putting the ask out there, allowing more and more people to get involved. And I'd hope that we can, you know, in many ways, recreate the process, even if the results or even if the actual activations that we're doing will be different. Um, but I think we really got what we were looking for out of it. And I hope that we just kind of like, tweak it and slightly improve it. But when it comes to learning and development and to my role in general, this was such a learning process for me. Um, well, it sounds super cliche for our roles, but you know, <laughs> it was a, a journey for sure. And it really ended up making me think a lot of how we talk about building community for new hires or in our leadership training or any of the programs that we're putting together because I feel like so many of us are in the same boat right now where we want people to connect. We know people want to connect and community is a word that is just so important to all of us at this time. It's like a concept, a word, a thing that everyone is craving. And so I think that realization that, you know, maybe not being 100% in control of it is actually for the best um, was really something that was that has really changed how I approach building community with even our new hires. So now when it comes to, you know, like how are they gonna connect in the future? Before I would have been like, okay, everyone, I'm gonna schedule in your calendar as a little one month reunion so you can all connect with each other. We'd have like, I don't know, three people show up because <laughs> this point people, you know, they've moved on or I'm not their trainer anymore. I can't force them to be there. Now, instead, when people are like, oh, we should meet up, I'm like, okay, who wants to set that up? You know, who wants to take ownership of that? And it's been so crazy just seeing how that has changed things. Like some of the groups that I've been giving more leeway to take ownership themselves, I see them, it's been weeks and weeks. Like I had a group six weeks ago and every day they still say good morning to each other in their channel. So just seeing how taking that step back really allows others to step forward has been just so influential to how I approach community building in my work in general. That is so awesome. Um, what, what I'm really, you know, amazed by is that you, you know, went from a situation where everything was sort of tanking and you were like, there's not going to be a community. And you actually not only made it uh, uh, sort of like achieve the results you, you've achieved before, but like you, you 10 x it. <laughs> you, you took advantage of the situation that sort of forced you to rethink, uh, to give up control, to, you know, uh, share ownership and to really truly build community of communities. Uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a really amazing story. I really thank you for, for sharing it. Um, I do want to uh, jump to some of the folks on the chat um, and sort of make sure that their comments and questions are brought into the conversation. So. I um, I see that, and I can't read your full name. Uh, comment is um, this amazing. I love how uh, out of box you and your team went to really utilize technology. Uh, can't can't agree more with that. Um, and then uh, okay, now I can see the names. Uh, and Marco said, "How are other communities at Shopify? How are other communities uh, at Shopify doing the same? Anything you want to share there?" Yeah, I love that question, Marco. So all of the resources that we built, and we built a lot. <laughs> like everything that we did with um, so many different technologies. I promised you all this was about remote technologies. It truly was. We used Sheets. We used like full Google Suite. We used Asana. 
sessions, which is plus plus. We used a uh, stream shark, like all these different tools that we used and we built and we got to know. We ended up creating like a playbook that we've now um, made sure that all other ERGs and Shopify have access to. So we've really been trying to share these resources within the organization. And it's been cool because I know at the beginning, what my team was working on really informed what I was building. And now I'm seeing the flip side where I shared the learnings I had from Latinx History or Heritage Month. And now that is being applied to our programs, to how we approach building community and uh, how we really are doing things as a team. That is so cool. Um, so I see another question. Um, Janine, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Um, yes, you are. All right. So <laughs> what are some of the things uh, that you use during Latinx event that you brought into onboarding? So much. Even some of the games and activities that we did, like the Loteria, I was like, anyone can play bingo. So now that is one of the things I set up for our new hires. And I think it's so fun because we always have, say, like Latinx folks in the group or people who have never heard but are curious about this culture and bringing such a like culture and heritage rich game to a completely new group of people I feel really sets a tone for like what it's going to be like at Shopify you know that we embrace and we celebrate these communities so that's one thing but then in terms of like strategies of engagement um we use the slack engagement strategies of like best practices in terms of like commenting, emojiing, really making sure people feel like their posts are being heard and valued. We've brought that into how we manage Slack communications with our new employees. So right from the bat, whenever they're uh, chatting with us, we're making sure to chat back with them. It's not like people's posts are just like sitting unattended to in the channel. And again, to the community building aspect. So as we're continuously iterating on like, how do we build community in startup, bringing those learnings that I've had from Latinx History Month to that. That's cool. Um, I have a, there's a question from Kim. I actually think this is very interesting about this idea of centralized versus distributed or decentralized onboarding and how that intersects with the community, right? On one hand, the way I read it is that the centralized onboarding can sort of set the tone for the larger organizational community, but decentralized one can be more localized and maybe more tailor fit to the local community. How do you think about that? And I'm not sure, Kim, if I'm quite ans uh, you know, asking the right question, but that's sort of what <laughs> triggered me. It was like, hmm, this is interesting. Like, how do you think about centralized onboarding, given that you're on the onboarding team and you're in some ways setting the tone for the community uh, that these folks are joining? I'd actually love to hear from Kim, if you could explain a little bit more detail what you mean by centralized versus decentralized, so I make sure that I'm answering sure. your question as best I can. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I could talk for hours with you about this topic <laughs> because I'm fascinated with how you do onboarding. So yes, currently what happens is when we onboard, we the manager really is taking the, the brunt of the responsibility of onboarding, and we're in the process of looking at that and evaluating it. Um, because even before everyone was remote at Namecheap, um, we did it in a very decentralized manner. And now that we are remote, it continues in that way. But I love this idea of a more, it looks like you do a more centralized process where you really are you know, sharing the culture and the values of the whole organization before you get into those more localized team values and processes. So that's what I was curious if you think that that helps to um, create more engagement with people across all of these places and, and teams. That's such a great question, Kim. And it's interesting because our tradition of, as you call it, centralized onboarding actually just stemmed from like pure accident. So our very first person at Shopify who was doing onboarding um, just happened to like, you know, have a group of people that she was onboarding together. And it just sort of continued and scaled from there. But now it's something that we look at with so much intention. And so not only are we doing a centralized onboarding for people in the same region or time zone, but they're actually all part of a global channel that includes people from all around the world. So they can see who is starting uh, in every single time zone at the same time as them. And I totally think that it really does help to build community. And I think that 
be more highly networked. There's a lot of research around um, highly networked employees and retention. Um, so the idea being that employees who basically know more people within the organization and have more bonds and relationships with people within the organization are more likely to stay. And that is something that I I feel on a personal level because there have been times where like in previous roles within Shopify, I've had ups and downs. And each time my onboarding group who are all around the world also and uh, in all different parts of the organization have been kind of like the people that I could turn to and speak with openly because we're not on the same team. So I think it's definitely helped to build that common experience and also to really share, make sure that everyone's getting the same messaging around values, around culture and expectations. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, just uh, just to add a bit from my uh, Twitter experience, we did in fact a, um, a, a research or a data team and the HR side did a research for one of the technical leadership training and looked at the, the the participation and the correlation to their likelihood to retain with the company and it showed very very strong correlations so we felt that um to your point Douglas, is that that you know having people be connected having be part of this large community uh, which is what our training enabled for really does or looks like it's it's uh, you know getting people to stay which is awesome um, there's a question from uh, Kristen around um, how many ERGs are there at Shopify and then how do they get access to this playbook to collaborate with one another? Thank you, Kristen. Um, we have currently seven ERGs, so for uh, Black, Indigenous, Asian, Latinx, women, um, folks with disabilities, and one more that I'm blanking on, <laughs> uh, but there are seven total and currently two budding ERGs in the making, one of them being for parents and caregivers, which I think is so important. Um, so we are all part of kind of like an umbrella program that is managed by diversity and belonging at Shopify. And there's a wonderful program manager. Her name is Maya Shukare. Hit her up on LinkedIn if you're curious for more. And she's the one who really coordinates all. So each of us is working very independently within certain like budget and parameters that they provide us with. Um, and then she's the one who's coordinating, like, where are we putting all our resources, usually Google Drive. Um, how are we meeting with each other? How are we sharing together? And we keep one calendar for every ERG so we can see kind of like, oh, you know, February is Black History Month. So that month. I'm going to reach out to, well, in advance of that month, I'd reach out to the Black ERG and be like, okay, what can we do together? How can we highlight your messaging? How can we amplify it? How can we put together something that showcases these intersectional identities of Afro-Latinx folks, for example? So this is something that like all year long we're working on. And um, I guess it's like, you know, kind of like an onion of community. You have like communities within communities within communities. And in this sense, I would say like the other ERG leaders, we've worked together so much, especially this year. Um, they're kind of like, they're good friends. So we reach out all the time and anytime that we're building something, it's like, okay, who has the resources? Who has some ideas? And we spend a lot of time just bouncing ideas off each other and uh, trying to learn and grow together. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so we are close to wrapping up. I, um, I wanted to see, invite to see if anyone in the audience has one final question. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap things up and, and explain tease a bit about what's coming up. So going once <laughs> and twice. Oh, actually, I have one thing to add for Kristen. Um, OK. Uh, from what I've heard, this is the rumor, but it might be coming true, is that we will be sharing our ERG resources publicly soon. So if that's something your organization is interested in, because clearly can apply beyond just employee resource groups, uh, definitely keep an eye out. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so with that, Peglas, I really want to thank you for your time uh, and the energy that you brought into this conversation to share this experience. It's pretty, really been truly remarkable to see what your team has been able to, to sort of accomplish, especially given all the challenges that you faced at the time and, and how you're able to not over, or only overcome them, but 10x sort of the success of, you know, previous years. So really amazing.